Good evening. We are going to continue our our study through the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 5. This is one great chapter. So much to cover. So we're going to jump right in. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, I I did want to go back uh, for a minute. Hey, Heldon, God bless you, brother. I wanted to go back and uh, pick up the last couple verses of chapter 4. There was a a point, I don't know if I really uh, spent enough time on it at the end of uh, last week or our last meeting. So verse 30 of chapter 4 says, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman should not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but but of the free. And obviously the bondwoman is Hagar, and her son is Ishmael. So he's saying, cast out Hagar and Ishmael. She won't have anything to do with the children of God, the children of promise. Uh, And he, hey, God bless you, Miguel. And so she, he right off draws a distinction between the sons of the free woman and sons of Hagar. Hagar was a slave, by the way, sons of the slave. So the slave's children cannot be co-heirs with the, with the sons of freedom. And, I, and there's a lot that could be said. Hey, Luann, God bless you. There's a lot that could be said about the, the bondwoman, the slave's children, as drawn distinctly uh, in contrast with the sons of God who are sons of freedom. I think if there's one distinct characteristic that separates the, cho- the true children of God versus those who are not the true children of God, it is freedom. And I think if if you want, how do I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die? How do I know God is with me? How do I, you want to know how you know? You know because you're free. You're free from sin. You're free from corruption. You're free from all that the world has keeping everybody in this system in bondage. Uh, you know, people just don't have peace. People don't have joy. People are struggling in all kinds of sin. Hey, G- Gary, Marty, God bless you guys. Luann, uh, God bless you guys. But we're in, we're in Galatians chapter 4, the last two verses. It says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. The bondwoman is Hagar. Her son is Ishmael. And, and the word of God draws a distinction between the sons of the free woman. That is the sons of, of Sarah. And what makes the distinction between the true children of God and those that are not is freedom. Jesus Christ came to set us free. And I will say that the work of Christ has not been accomplished in your life uh, completely until you're set free. If Jesus has his way, you are going to be free from sin, free from depression, free from fear, free from bondage of any kind. Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. Brianna, good, good evening. Terrence, how you guys doing? So this is the, the, the aspect of the gospel I think that we can't overemphasize is that Jesus Christ came to set us free. And notice, he said, cast out that bond woman and her son, that is her offspring, those that are in bondage, they're slaves, they're not real, they're they're entrapped still, they're entangled still still in in the world, in the devil, in corruption. The, The promise of the New Testament, the promise of Jesus Christ is that he would set us free. And, uh... Whom the Son says free, John 8, 36 says, is free indeed. True freedom. It's not a supposed freedom. So we need to emphasize this. And and we really won't emphasize it if we ourselves, Julie, God bless you, Vanessa, Nora, God bless you guys. We won't emphasize this issue of freedom until we ourselves are free. So if we're not free from sin, if you're listening to me tonight and you're not free from sin, I just want to encourage you. Cast out the bond woman and her son. You can have freedom. I don't care what bondage. I don't care what trap you you were. And I don't care how you got trapped. I don't care if it was something that happened in your childhood or if it's from a life of sin or if it's from somebody else that's offended you or affected you or held you or whatever the issue is. If you're in bondage, don't stop until you're free. And let's not wait till we get to heaven to be free. Thank God when we get to heaven, we're going to see Jesus like he is. We're going to be transformed. We're going to have new bodies. But we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to experience the, to experience the benefits of redemption. The, the idea of most Christians is that when we get to heaven, we're going to be free. When we get to heaven, we're going to have joy. When we get to heaven, we're going to have peace. Man, I just think that minimizes the work of Jesus Christ and what he came to accomplish. Jesus, it says, came to destroy the works of the devil. 
And the works of the devil are all those things that are against God's will. That's the work of the devil. When, when Adam and Eve were in the garden with God, there was no sickness, there was no sin, there was no corruption, there was no depression, there was no anxieties, there were no fears. There was just man walking with their God. Well, when sin came, all kinds of corruption came and defiled mankind. Jesus came to break the power of the devil right now. And so we are to experience the benefits of redemption, the benefits of the cross right now. And I would say that's how we know we're walking with God. We have freedom from sin, freedom from oppression, uh, breakthrough. We have, we have it now. And that's what we need to be preaching. And we won't preach it unless we ourselves are walking in it. So it's important that we see the, the, the idea of Christ in redemption is to set us free from our sin and our bondage. I'm sure we'll get back to that as we go through. But that's how we close chapter four. Cast out the bondwoman and her son, her offspring. For she, the bondwoman, the slave, they won't have uh, the same heir. That they won't jo enjoy the co-heirship that we have with Christ. They can't enjoy the benefits of sonship like we who have experienced the freedom of Christ. So freedom, liberty, is the symptom, the sign that we are following Jesus Christ. So he starts off chapter five with stand fast therefore in the liberty or in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And circumcision obviously is, is indicative of following the law. So these Jewish believers, and this is important because it sets the stage of what he's going to go into next. But these Jewish believers were preaching circumcision. They were trying to go back. They were, they were okay with acknowledging Jesus as Lord. They were okay with, with going to church and applying some of the new teachings of Paul. But they wanted to mingle back the old thing that they were comfortable with, familiar with, with Christianity. And so... They were pointing to Jesus and then Moses at the same time. And Paul said, stand fast in the liberty that you've been. If you go and get circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Listen to what he says. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. If you try to mingle that in, then you better keep all of it and you know you can't. For I testify, uh, for verse 4, he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are of you who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So if we attempt... After having experienced the freedom of Christ, the life of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the things of God, the Word of God, if we attempt to try to go and, and mingle in something into this that isn't approved of God through Jesus Christ, you're fallen from grace. So it is possible then to fall from grace. It is possible uh, to experience the goodness of God, experience the grace of God, and then fall from it. In another place in 2 Corinthians, he says, uh, he begged the church not to receive the grace of God in vain. That is to accept it, experience the freedom, the deliverance, the power of God, and then fall from it or receive it in vain, meaning it went, it went to no avail. It, didn't, it came up short of its intended purpose. The intended purpose of grace is to elevate us out of the old life. That is bondage, that is even the good parts of our old life, even, even those parts of our old life that we don't think are that bad. Well, Christ sets us free from all of that old life. We are to walk in newness, complete and total newness of life. And to go back to the old way, the old thinking, the old mind, and try to mingle that in with your Christianity, you can fall right out of the grace of God. So anyway, he said, we are, we, verse 5, are through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Even our righteousness comes through hope in Christ by faith. We've got to keep it in faith. Uh, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. W what a critical statement. The, the, the aspect that causes us to progress in God, the, the thing that causes us to progress in God is faith. And faith, it says, only works by love. That is so critical because if you don't walk in love, it will hinder your ability to have faith. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I've seen it in my own life where... If, if you're not, if you get into contentiousness and strife, uh, these, are, these are deadly, deadly sins that will cripple your ability to walk with God. There, there, and I've, I've begun to notice this over the, I'd say over the last year more than in my whole entire life. You know, when we, when we read through the New Testament and we see things that are over and over emphasized, you know, these are main considerations. One of those I would have to say 
Maybe the most important is obedience and holiness. I mean, as a new Christian, I thank God I was raised on on holiness and obedience because the man that led me to the Lord emphasized that. So when I started reading the Bible for myself, it was easy for me to see that holiness was the call. Hey, Adam, God bless you, Lily. It was easy for me to see that holiness was a main theme throughout the New Testament. I thank God I started there. Then also, uh, I, I began to notice recently, equal to holiness, equal to obedience, is this idea of mercy and love. And, and particularly avoiding strife, avoiding envy, avoiding jealousy, avoiding contentiousness. Uh, the, the, the idea that we can be holy and be argumentative and full of anger and full of bitterness and jealousy and strife, there's no such thing as holiness in, in that, in that, with that attitude. And I begin to see, I mean, like, like Hebrews 12 is a good example. It says, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So peace with everybody and holiness is put on the same plane. And, and, and clearly, we're taught that if we don't have holiness and peace with all men, we will not see the Lord in our life. The Lord will be blocked from our life. We won't have any, any real blessing. So there's something so important about walking in love, walking in mercy, walking in uh, what, what I would say peace with all men. Because if you're not at peace with man, you're going to limit your ability to have faith. You're going to limit your ability to break through in God. So he said, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then he said, circumcision means nothing. Uncircumcision means nothing. But in Christianity, the, the, what really matters is faith, which worketh by love. So if we're angry or bitter or fighting or striving, we will not be able to operate out of the place of faith. And without faith, we cannot make any progress in the Christian life. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is and and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So our faith has to be in that God is, but also that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So that if we chase God and seek God and come after God, we're going to find Him and we're going to break through and we're going to have... But if we don't have love, it will hinder our ability to come to God in faith. I would say a lot of people's problem... Is their, is their attitude, anger, strife, bitterness, unforgiveness, always being fighting and contentious and argumentative. That will hinder you more than anything maybe in the Christian life. So many passages, it, it, uh, there are promises, there are benefits, and he's, he's going through, and then all of a sudden he'll stop and say, but first go make it right with your brother, or first forgive if any man has uh, a quarrel with any, forgive even as Christ and God forgave you. So... It's amazing. I've started to pick up how many places the Bible actually warns against strife and envy and fighting and warring. And by the end of this chapter, we'll actually come back to this. So I'll, I'm going to pass over it for now. But make no mistake about it. If you're not walking in love, you will not be able to have faith. And, and God has designed this Bible is a book of faith. If you don't operate out of faith, the Bible is just a bunch of words. It's nothing. There's no meaning to it. The, the Bible has to be apprehended or accepted and activated by faith. And faith can only work by love. So maybe the reason we don't walk in enough faith is because we don't walk in enough love. They work together. Faith worketh by love. So we'll leave it there. But you did run well, he said. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who's, who sidetracked you? This persuasion does not come from him that called you. It doesn't come from God. So where does it, it comes from the underworld. There are people in the church that are influenced by the demonic realm and they have bad, bad attitudes and they have a, an agenda that's not God's agenda and they're trying to trip up the people of God and either pull them back into legalism or pull them into strife or pull them into anger. You have got to guard your heart against anger, against bitterness, against strife, against jealousy, against envy, against uh, having any kind of war. Uh, just forgive. The best thing we can do is just forgive those who hurt us. Pray for those who spitefully use us and don't let their negativity or their agenda get on us and drag our hearts down because it will, the second we get into unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, jealousy, anger, strife, contention, the, the second we cross into that realm, we exit love and we exit faith. So it's something we've got to guard constantly and even more so as we see the day approaching because one of the warnings in the last days 
is that the love of many, because iniquity will abound, Jesus said, the love of many will grow cold or wax cold. But he said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. I mean, that's from our Lord Jesus, Matthew chapter 24. Cold love, that, that there are going to be so many opportunities. Hey, Carlos, Krista, God bless you guys. There are going to be so many opportunities for your love, my love, to grow cold, to get anger or bitter or carry a chip on our shoulder. We, we can't allow the devil to corrupt our faith, our love. We have got to be so quick to forgive, quick to release people from any, even if they uh, really offend us and hurt us. We, it, the only one it hurts to keep a bitterness, a, a grudge, so to speak, is our own life. It doesn't hurt anybody but ourselves. So we've got to guard ourselves because the enemy is going to try to send in discord. He's going to try to sow discord amongst the brethren to try to get us to have animosity one toward the other. We've got to know that this is the devil's device. It's probably his number one tactic to those that are truly seeking the higher higher life in God. That Probably the number one tactic of the enemy. Once he knows he won't get you to drink, he won't get you to drugs, he won't get you to maybe sexual immorality. So the next thing he tries to turn you into is, is a grudge, a bitterness, an animosity, an anger, a tension with the brethren. And if you allow that, if you succumb to that, Though you don't fornicate, though you don't drink alcohol, though you don't do drugs, though you don't do some of those big sins, you can still be corrupted because of anger and strife and bitterness. And it's as, as damaging to our spiritual life as immorality, as fornication, as adultery, or any of the other grotesque sins that we can, we can mention. So we've got to guard our hearts, make them sensitive and pliable. And if, if you feel yourself, and this is something I, I, have to, I have to work at maybe harder than some people, because in my old life I was very angry and I had a lot of bitterness and I would fight quick. And it, So this is something I'm telling you I have to work hard at, not allowing people who offend me or hurt me to get me a grudge or a bitterness. Remember, Peter even said, husbands, do not be bitter against your wives, lest your prayers be hindered. So it's a warning, not just to husbands, it's a warning to men of God, women of God. Don't let anybody, even your, the ones you love, don't let them get you in a, a grudging condition because it limits your ability to love and your ability to have faith and thus limits your ability to progress in God. Big, big deal. We'll actually come back to that again. But a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And what he means by that is we, if we let a little bit of, of compromise into our life, into the church or into our life or into anything. A little bit of compromise in our business, a little bit of compromise in our marriage, a little bit of compromise in our spiritual life, a little bit of compromise in our church. And the next thing you know, that little bit of leaven, it works itself through the entire thing. And suddenly you're inundated with corruption. And I think a lot of marriages were spoiled because they let a little bit of leaven in. A lot of churches have been spoiled because they let a little bit of leaven. They, they just lowered the standard a little bit. They let a little bit of compromise in. A lot of people's spiritual life today is a shipwreck, but it didn't start off shipwreck. They were really in love with Jesus. They were really tracking with God, but they let a little bit of compromise in. Watching TV on stuff they know they shouldn't watch, but eh, everybody does it. A little bit of leaven in, and next thing you know, their spiritual life got shipwrecked. So we've got to guard ourselves against leaven, against compromise, against anything. That, if we know it's not of God, I know everybody else around you is compromising. You, you know, you look around and you just think, even pastors, you see what they allow in their lives. And you, you know, it's easy to let your guard down. If there's one thing that we need to shake ourselves up to, to, to obey is that we hold the standard of Christ, the word of God, without compromise, even though everybody around us may be compromising. It's easy to look at them and say, well, if, if they're doing it, I'm okay. If my pastor does it, it's, okay. it's not okay. And the little bit of leaven that you let in today will affect you so much more tomorrow. And I think a lot of people are in horrible situations, but it all started with just a little bit of leaven. So let's not even let that leaven in. Let's shut the door in the devil's face every single time and give God the glory that he deserves. So he said, I have confidence in the Lord through the Lord and you, that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubles you, in other words, those believers in the church is really who he's referring to, that tried to mingle in legalism, law, some demonic influence, and they tried to mingle it into the church. And Paul said, I'm, I'm confident that they're going to bear their burden. They're going to bear their, 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 their judgment, whosoever he is. See, it's a person that he's referring to. I'm sure, I'm sure he, and when Paul said this, there was a particular person that was causing the trouble Paul said, I'm, he's going to get his judgment, whoever he be. 
Uh, he's, he's bringing in something. And this is the, the voice of a father here who's concerned for his children. He, he brought these sons of freedom into Christ and liberated them from their old life. And to see the enemy creeping in through people and trying to mingle or pervert the true children, the sons of freedom, Paul isn't standing for it. He said he's going to get his, whoever he is. You can hear his love there. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Now, that's a major point right there. He said, if I preach circumcision, if, if and, and remember, he's, he's a Jew who used to preach circumcision. That was his message with circumcision. Paul made a clean break from that message of circumcision. For him to go back to circumcision would have been easy. It would have been, it would have been kosher. It would have made him a lot more likable. It would have made him a lot more uh, one of the boys. He would have fit in better. Even he, uh, he accuses Peter of falling back into this, this Judaistic thing where he was showing favoritism to other Jews. But Paul, he said, no way. If I go back, if I allow that old thing to creep in, then the offense of the cross ceases. In other words, the, the cross is no longer effective if I go back and mingle in something of my old life. And he is warning the church, do not let it. And then he, this is a, maybe the strongest statement in the chapter. I wish that they were even cut off to trouble you. What a statement. This is the anger of Paul, but this is righteous indignation. He's, he sees these, these men creeping in and per perverting and corrupting the church. He said, I wish they were completely cut off. They are going to get their judgment that they deserve because it's one thing if you want to go and, and deceive yourself or if you want to go compromise, that's your choice. But to bring it into the church and try to mingle and pervert. Paul, as the father, is standing against this pharisaical... I mean, if you want to see where Paul is just like Jesus... It's in this area. Jesus, if you notice, he was very compassionate when he came across an adulterer. You know, the adulterer, the woman caught in the very act, he didn't condemn her. But when, when there were Pharisees that were fighting against the message of truth or corrupting what was true, the true worship of God, there was nothing that Jesus was more against, more passionate about, more fierce about than combating these Pharisees, these religious people that mingle or corrupt the truth of, turn the truth of God into a lie. Jesus had no patience for that. He was harder on the Pharisees than he was on the adulterer because the Pharisees were religious leaders who were not only corrupting themselves, but were mingling and corrupting the very people of God. Paul has no patience for that either. Both Paul and Jesus, they didn't have any patience for Pharisees. No patience for, for religious corruption. So, brethren, Again, he says, you've been called under liberty. You've been called under freedom. You've been called to be free, sons of freedom, sons of liberty. Only, here he says, do not use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Don't use your liberty. So he's saying, yes, you're free. All things may be lawful, but not all things are beneficial. Yes, you have freedom in Jesus. Nobody can bring you back into bondage. But don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. In other words, just because you're free doesn't mean you can go do whatever you want. You can if that's what you choose to do, but judgment is inevitable for those who take the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness or license to live any way they want. So when we talk about freedom, when we talk about not living under the yoke of bondage of the law and don't let anybody take you under legal, we're, we're not saying that it, there, there's no uh, place for uh, obedience to commandments or works or any of those things. Of course there is. But it's out of a love relationship. It's out of a walk, a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, not out of trying to perform to uh, impress or to be religious or to be whatever. But there is a place where we don't use our liberty as an occasion to go serve ourselves. But the liberty that we have, we give even our liberty back to God and say, yes, I'm free, but I give you my freedom because my life is your life, God. And so my life is wrapped up in serving Christ and then serving others. And he takes it. Another step forward when he says, for all the laws is fulfilled in this one word. Even this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. That is the fulfillment of the law. In other words, all that the law was after, the thou shalt not and the commandments and the ordinances, the, 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 the total sum of all the law was after was love. And if we have as our aim, love, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then loving our neighbor's as we love ourselves. If we love and we're, we're actively trying to walk in the, the highest 
quality of love, humanly possible or even beyond humanly possible, then we have no problems with keeping rules because we will not do anything to harm or hurt or injure anybody, but by love we will serve one another. And I think this is a critical thing in 2019 that we have got to get in our brains. Our duty as Christians is to serve, not to be served. Jesus said, I didn't come to serve, but to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. And he washed the disciples' feet and he says, you know I'm your Lord. You call me your Lord and rightly so, for I am your Lord. And if I, your Lord, have washed your feet, I've left you uh, 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 a picture of what I want you to do. Now wash one another's feet. In other words, I've served you. Now I'm giving you a pattern. Go and serve. Don't don't think because we're spiritual or we, we're sons of God, we're heirs of God, we have anointings and we're, we're gifted. Don't think that that means people should come and serve us. The highest uh, place in God is that of service. And the one that wants to be greatest in God must be the servant of all. That's a mindset that you have to be intentional about, to put yourself low, to make yourself last, and to put others before yourself. That's a mindset that doesn't come natural, but it is something that we can train ourselves to do. All, all of us can and should. But he said, verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, and this is, you notice how many times he keeps coming back to this concept. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then. In other words, the opposite of biting, devouring, anger, animosity, bitterness, strife, the opposite of that, you know what the opposite of that is? Walking in the spirit. That's why he says the next, th next thing, this I say then. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. Now, this is the key to the whole thing, because we're talking about not getting under laws, not getting under legalism, not letting people force you to you know, live according to their standard. And so the, the opposite of that, though, is you don't, you don't have any, uh, I guess, uh, standards, or you don't, have, you don't let any parameters or guidelines be on your life, and you, li you just live a free-for-all. Neither one of those is, is good. Both of those are, are error. The, the middle line, though, is that we walk in the Spirit. And see, any, any righteousness that we, we chase after, any works that we perform, any goodness uh, is, is the result of us walking in the Spirit. So we're doing it out of fellowship with God through the Spirit. So we will, be, we will have more works than those people that had in the law. We will have more righteousness than those people had under the law. We will have more obedience than they had under the law. But it's not because we're looking to a, rule, a list of rules, but we're actually in fellowship with God through the Spirit and we're walking in unity with the Spirit of God. And that fellowship enables us to live at such a higher plane so that we will have so much... Uh, uh, self-control. We will have so much discipline. We will have so much passion. We will have so much love. And people might look at us and think we're doing it like because we're so um, into this list of rules. But no, it's because we're walking by the Spirit. And we know in our, in our heart, when, you're, when your goal is to have unity with the Spirit of God, you know what offends Him. You know what grieves Him. That's why the Bible said, do not grieve the Spirit. Do not grieve the Spirit. Now, if you're walking with the Spirit and you're trying to be in unity with Him, and, and that's an intentional thing that you have to do all day. If you're really going to be a man or a woman of the Spirit, you can't turn that life on and off. It's either a life all the time or it's not at all. And if you know, if you're trying to walk in the Spirit, you know you're sensitive to Him. You, you know what grieves Him. You know what offends Him. You know what causes Him to, 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 to lift from your life. And you will do anything to keep him close to you if you really want him. And as a result of that, you will be walking on eggshells because you don't want to offend him. You don't want to grieve him. And, and for sure, you don't want to offend another brother because Jesus said it's, more, uh, it, it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and for you to be drowned in the sea than for you to cause one of his little ones to stumble. So you would just as soon take wrong from people than be an offense or a stumbling block or a hurt one of Jesus Christ's followers. So as you walk in the Spirit, you will fulfill the law. You will walk in holiness. You will have good works. But it's not because you're doing chasing works or trying not to, to, to break one of the commands, the Ten Commandments. It's because you're walking in the Spirit. And as you walk in the Spirit, I'll tell you right now how you know somebody's walking in the Spirit. They won't allow bitterness in their life. 
Notice what he said before that. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you're not consumed by one another. This I say then, therefore, walk in the Spirit. The opposite of walking in the Spirit is biting, devouring, strife, contentious, jealousy, envy, vainglory. That is the opposite of walking in the Spirit. Anybody walking in the Spirit, you will know they're walking in the Spirit because they will not argue and fight and strive and try to antagonize or hurt or cause pain to another believer. Uh, they, they'd rather just look wrong, bite their tongue, and go the other way than offend the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you, one of the main issues of, of us that inhibits or, or prevents us from walking in the Spirit is is just what I've been discussing, the lack of peace, the lack of joy, the lack of treating others the way that you would want to be treated, the, the lack of treating people like Christ. And uh, he, he actually confirms this in the last part of this chapter, which we'll get to. So we'll just keep going here. This is good stuff. So this he says, therefore, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. So how do you get out of sin? How do you stop fulfilling the lust of your flesh? Because for some of us, the lust of our flesh... It can be different things. For some of us, it's our anger problem. For some of us, it's a drug addiction. For some of us, it's a sexual addiction. For some of us, it's just self-righteousness or pride or worldliness. We just want to go and do what we want. How do we break the back of that thing without doing it like they did in the law where they had the commandments written down and they reminded each other, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt Well, in the New Testament, if we're not following the thou shalt not, how do we keep from falling into the traps of the flesh? There's only one way. It's walking in the Spirit. And this isn't keeping just rules. This is actual fellowship with a person, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's beneficial for you that I go. For if I go, I will send him to you. He will take what's mine and declare it to you. He will show you things to come. He will, he will be your comforter. He will be your helper. He will be your teacher. The Holy Spirit, a person, a he, will come and help you, aid you, encourage you, strengthen you. So as you're walking with a person, you see there's relationship, there's fellowship, there's closeness, there's a walk. It's, it's accountability of the highest kind when you live a such a way where every step you think, the Holy Spirit is with me. The Lord is watching me. The Lord is here. You're, you, it's an awareness of the most high kind. There's always somebody in the room with you. And you live in such a way that you wouldn't want to displease Him. Now when you live with that consciousness of the Holy Spirit, then you are going to fulfill the law. You're going to walk in righteousness. And you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. That's the only way to consistently break the back of sin in your life is to walk in the Spirit. If you do it out of a, a self-condemnation or a guilt, that'll only go so far and it'll, it'll wear off. But if you develop a sensitivity to the Spirit of God that He's always there, He's in you, He's watching you, He's with you, He wants to aid you. When you develop that sensitivity, it's not that hard to quit sinning. If you try to do it individually apart from the Holy Spirit, it's always hard. You feel like such a burden. It's always so hard. But John said his commandments are not burdensome. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. When you're walking with Jesus through the Spirit, it's easy to keep, easier to keep commandments. If you're trying to change yourself, if you're trying to alter or modify your behavior apart from walking in the Spirit, there's death. It's the same as the law. It's you doing it in your own strength, and that'll never last. It'll never go through temptation. It'll never go through trial. But when you're with somebody and you rec recognize the Holy Spirit's activity in your life, it's, it's a lot easier to walk. It's a lot easier to obey. It's a lot easier to keep from the lust of the flesh. So he said, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust. But walk, notice it's walk in the Spirit. It's not something you just do once. It's not something you just do twice. It's something you do every single step. Walking is stepping. And every step has to be in the Spirit. And whatever steps aren't in the Spirit, wherever you leave the presence of the Holy Spirit and go walking off by yourself, your, your, your downfall is in, imminent. If it's not one thing, it'll be another thing because you've left that presence, the abiding presence of God. Remember what Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Anybody that doesn't abide in me is cast forth as a branch and is withered. If we break fellowship, if we break the a connection, if we go off journeying our Christian life by ourselves, man, what a lonely, hard time we will have. 
and we will feel like, man, it's so hard. There's so many rules. There's so many commandments. But see, when you're walking in the Spirit, you don't even recognize how many rules or commandments there are because you have but one commandment. Love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love my neighbor as myself. And you endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Okay. Listen to what it says. The flesh lusts against the Spirit. That is, your old nature is fighting against the nature of God. Your old nature. This is the, the saga that Paul defines in Romans 7. The one where so many people think Paul was talking about himself in Romans 7. Where he said, the things I don't want to do, these things I do. The things I want to do, these things I don't do. Paul wasn't describing himself. I have a video on that on YouTube. You can go get that. I hate to just breeze over that, but I have an hour teaching on that to show you. It's not Paul discussing, describing himself or he would be the biggest hypocrite there ever was because he co clearly commands the church to abstain from all fornication, unholy things, uh, uncleanness, and on and on and on. But he was describing the, the saga, the battle of humanity who's born in a sinful nature, whose natural tendency is to serve ourselves, please ourselves, do what feels good, do what seems good, and to uh, ignore the ways of God. But the new man who's renewed in knowledge knows the will of God. He has the Spirit, and he wants to live a life pleasing. But if we don't walk in the Spirit, it's impossible to fulfill the life God requires. In other words, if you try to put new wine into an old wineskin, the, the, the bottle will burst, Jesus said. In other words, if you try to live the Christian commandments in the flesh, in the sin nature, in your own abilities... You will come up short every single time. It will feel hard, laborious, overwhelming. How do I do it? You're, you can't do it. The only one that can live the life of Jesus is Jesus. That's why the life I now live, he's, Paul said, I don't live by myself, but I live by the faith of the Son of God. I am crucified to the world. I'm dead, nevertheless I live. Not I though, but Christ liveth in me. So the only way we can fulfill the life God requires is through the life of Jesus Christ. So if we try to do it in the flesh, it's like putting old new wine into an old wineskin. Jesus said the bottles will burst and everything will spill out. So many people are trying to live the New Testament life with an Old Testament mindset. The only way to fulfill this thing is to live it in Jesus Christ. So it's a walk. It's a daily stepping. You never can get out of it. If you do, then you enter the flesh. So the flesh and the spirit are lusting or fighting or warring against one another. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you want. In other words, you'll never be able to reach that holy place that you, that you desire if you try to do it without God. Because there's a fight, a war going on. And Jesus is the only one that can live the Christian life in you and through you. So I know that might sound funny to some, but one day maybe I'll go deeper with that. But if you be led by the Spirit, verse 18 says... If you be led by the Spirit, then you are not under the law. I love that. There is no more law to govern you. The Spirit of God is the only governing force of your life when you live in the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, nobody has to tell you what to do or what not to do. Nobody has to give you advice. Uh, thank God for advice. Some of it I'd be better off without. But nobody has to tell you anything. The, the Bible says you have no need that any man should teach you. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't hear men teach. It's good because as we're as you're hearing people teach, you're, you're hearing them reaffirm things that you already know. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know. It's just I'm reaffirming it with passion. That, that, and when you hear it, it just reaffirms and quickens. We're encouraging one another. But you don't have anybody to, you don't need me to sit here and tell you not to lie. You don't need me to sit here and tell you not to steal. You don't need me to tell you not to, not to uh, curse your wife. You don't need me to tell you not to cheat your boss out of time at work. You don't need me to tell you any of that stuff. Because the very Spirit of God, if you're walking with Him, will let you know what you're doing good and what you're not doing good. He'll quicken you. He'll chasten you. He'll correct you. He'll encourage, exhort. He'll do whatever it takes to keep you in the place. Place of communion with him. So if you're under the spirit, no laws are required anymore. What are you saying? I can just do whatever I want. If you're walking in the spirit, you will, you will do whatever you want in the spirit. And if you can get away with it in the spirit, then you'll know it's okay. But I'll be willing to bet if you're walking in the spirit, you won't break one of these New Testament commandments. And it won't be because you're reading them off a list. It'll be because you won't want to offend the Holy Ghost. And if you did, you won't be able to go to bed. If you did offend him, if you did do something wrong, you have to make that thing right. He'll make sure of it. So, the works of the flesh, verse 19, he goes through this list. And I think this is important, uh, mostly because these are, these, are, these are here for a reason. 
Now, I want to just tell you, there's, there's Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Then there's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. And then there's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Those three chapters, Galatians, Ephesians, and 1 Corinthians, basically give this same list, give or take a few, and they say basically the same thing. It's a serious warning. I've heard Christians mutilate this, and I don't know why they have to do that. But the Bible goes through a list. Here, I'll give you the list. Here is the works of the flesh are, are evident or manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, seditions, and heresies. Notice how many of those works of the flesh deal with how you treat other people, how you respond to other people, how you act with other people, how you relate to other people. Most of those deal with how you treat people. By the way, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like all these kinds of sins, in other words. Of which I told you before, this is Paul speaking, I already told you this once, I told you before, as I have also told you in times past, he reiterates that he's already made this clear to them on more than one occasion, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, So people who live in those life practices, those sinful things that he just listed, will not go into heaven. Now I've heard people try to justify that away, especially the ones they've always said people. They feel like they have to explain everything away that looks like there could be a judgment of hell for believers. And they try to explain it away and say, well, Paul wasn't talking to, about the church there. He was talking about the world. Isn't that funny? Now that you've been with me and we've gone through this whole book of Galatians and we've gotten now here to the end. Now the whole way through, you would have to agree he's talking to the same group of people over and over and over. Now you get to this one part and people say, oh, well, he wasn't talking to the church there. He was talking to non-believers. I think that is the most ridiculous thing you can do is try to explain away passages that go against your doctrine. Look, he's so clear here. He's, he's as clear in Ephesians 5. He's as clear in 1 Corinthians 6. The ones that live in these sinful characteristics do not go to heaven. You will not go to heaven living as a fornicator. You will not go to heaven living as a liar. You will not go to heaven living as any of these drunkenness, no drunkard. 1 Corinthians 6 says, has any part in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ. In the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus makes this list. He says, no unclean person, no uh, this and no that will, ha will, will be able to enter into the heavenly city. They will be exiled, locked out of the heavenly city. So just in case anybody gets the, uh, the, the idea that because we're saying don't live under the law, you can live unrighteously. Unrighteous people don't go to heaven. No unrighteous person. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says, shall enter the kingdom of God or kingdom of We are not called to just the righteousness of the law. We're called to a whole nother level of righteousness. And again, that doesn't mean, well, I better go try to fix this or stop doing that. Or No, it means you need to get in the spirit. You need to develop a friendship with the spirit of God, a, a communion where you don't break ranks, where you live a life pleasing, where you don't want to offend or push or grieve the Holy Spirit away from your life. By doing that, you'll live way more holy than you were ever. And your, your, your prayer is, Lord God Almighty, help me. Set me free from this, that, and the other. Don't try to go out and fix yourself. The, the Spirit of God wants to partner with you in the destruction of your flesh. He'll help you. He'll, he'll guide you. He'll keep you. He'll, he'll, he'll even encourage you while you're going through it. And that's the only way you'll make it. You'll last. Now he draws the distinction. So that's the works of the flesh. But he said the fruit of the Spirit is love is joy, is peace, is long-suffering, is gentleness, is goodness, is faith, is meekness, and is temperance. Against such, there is no law. Now, here's the, here's the clincher here. He said, those are the works of the flesh. He said, your flesh will do those things naturally. Those works of the flesh are warring because your sin nature is warring against another nature, the nature of God. And there's a battle going on, a fight. Uh, uh, who's going to win? Is your flesh going to govern you or is the Spirit of God going to govern you? Well, well, the good news is when you allow the Spirit of God to take over your personality, your life, your will, boy, He will bring you into love that you never thought possible. The Romans 5.5, 5, I love this verse. He said, the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fills your heart with love. So it's not you trying to love more. I remember in my early Christian life, I would see I'm supposed to love. I got to try to love better. You know, you forget about that in a few minutes. You don't even, it's not, it's hard. There's so many things that you're to do better or try harder with or to develop more. You can't focus on all of those things all the time. 
But you can focus on being filled with the Spirit all the time. You can focus on developing a sensitivity, a walk with the Holy Spirit. And the amazing thing is, as we live a life pleasing, walking with the Holy Spirit, love increases, joy. So the fruit of the Spirit is the byproduct of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. When you walk in the Spirit, love increases, joy increases, peace increases, righteousness increases. Those things increase because you're walking with God. When you're walking outside of the Spirit, you cannot get rid of these sin habits. You might be able to stop some of them, but there's always going to be fleshly manifestations, carnal realities in your life. Because you can't change yourself. It's only by the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you will be amazed at the love that you will walk in. You will, you will, you will be amazed at the mercy, the forgiveness, the, the, the peace, the joy that you're able to walk in. Remember, the kingdom of God, it says, is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You see that? It's in the Holy Ghost. Ghost. And then the next thing it says is, and he that in these things serveth God is acceptable to Christ, and in a, in a, uh, he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Romans tells us that the kingdom of God, the essence of the kingdom, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is to say, we live in the Holy Ghost in perfect peace, perfect righteousness, and perfect joy. And as we walk in the Spirit, these manifestations become our reality. And that's how you know the kingdom. So you say, how do you know, how do you know somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit? I can tell you now, don't, don't look at their ability to preach. Don't look at whatever gift they operate in because, see, that has nothing to You can have a gift. And I'm going to tell you what, there's some really gifted people who end up in sexual immorality, adultery, drunkenness. Listen, we don't gauge how close somebody is to the Holy Spirit by the gift that they operate in. Gifting isn't the same thing as walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit, somebody who walks in the Spirit will have love, they'll have joy, they'll have peace, they'll be long-suffering, they'll have meekness, they'll have all the goodness and all this, the gentleness, the things that we just went through. That's the evidence that you're walking in the Spirit. So if you're lacking these fruits of the Spirit, don't go try to get more of them. Get in the Spirit. Yield yourself. Let go of your fleshly carnal life and give your life to God and let Him rule over you. And you'll be amazed. Verse 25. Or verse 24, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and with its lusts. You know what your affections are, your desires. Listen, those that are Christ's have crucified or put to death their own affections. They don't live for their own affections. This is These are the people of Christ. The people of Christ have exchanged their affections in this life for the affections of Jesus Christ. Notice Jesus said five times, he that seeks to save his life in this world will lose it. And he that loses his life in this world will find it for eternity. In other words, whoever gives up his affections, his desires, his passions, in exchange for the, for the passions and, and, the, and the, the things of God, the, 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 the passions of God, whoever exchanges his passions for God's passions will live forever. But if we refuse to give up our passions, our desires, our affections here on this life, then we will not have it in the life to come. Colossians 3 is a good passage for that. It says, If you've then been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Set your passions on things above. So those that are Christ have exchanged their passion. They don't have any passion that's not God's passion. If, if it's not God's passion, they don't want anything to do with it. You see, that's what it means to walk in the Spirit. Not trying harder not to sin. That's not it. It's living after God's passions. What makes God passionate? What makes God happy? What brings God pleasure? That's what the real saint wants. He wants what makes God happy. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit. It's an inward yielding of your affections, your desires, and your passions for His. And once you get His passions, you're going to find they're much better than your passions were anyway. You just thought your passions were good. His passions. Boy, when He gives you a burden for souls... When he lets you see a glimpse of eternity and that you have the, the answer to every problem in this world, if you don't get passionate about that, your passionate is broken. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So in other words, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you're a born again child of God, then walk in it. And that shows you. It just doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't just do it by itself. He said, if you live in the Spirit... 
than walk in the Spirit, showing you you can live in the Spirit and not walk in the Spirit. In other words, you can be born again and then choose to go back to the flesh. If you do it long enough, you'll find the Spirit won't be there anymore. But there is a, it is possible that you can be born again, have the Spirit, and then not walk in the Spirit. And I think that saddens him more than anything. Because remember, the Bible says that the Spirit that dwelleth in you lusts to envy. The Spirit that dwells in you is desirous of you. That is to say, you get born again, the Spirit comes inside of you. He doesn't automatically have, have communion with you. He wants to have communion. He wants to have fellowship. But it, He won't cross your will and force you to do it. So it's up to you to stop your life. It's up to you to slow yourself down. It's up to you to focus on it. It's up to you to cry out. It's up to you to desire. It's up to you to yield up your affections. And I'll tell you, if you keep your affections and your passions and do what you want to do, you will not be able to have the fellowship with the Spirit. So you'll be in your mind saying, I need more of the Holy Spirit. I need to walk in the Holy Spirit. You can say that for five and ten years and never get deeper in the Holy Spirit because it's not a hope or a wish you need. It's a the dedication, a consecration to say, Lord, not what I will, but your will be done. I exchange my affections for your affections. And from this day forward, I'm going to do what makes you happy. Now, when you enter that kind of a fellowship, that kind of a relationship, that kind of a journey, a walk of communion in the spirit, whoo-wee, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing more exciting than that. There's nothing more satisfying than that. But up front, it looks like, oh, you mean I've got to give up my my free time? I've got to give up my TV time? I've got to give up my hobby? That's, that's a broken down mindset that even thinks that way. It's not that you have to give up your hobby. It's you get to give your hobby up for the Spirit of God. You get to give up your pursuits, your passions for the passions and pursuits of God. And I'm going to tell you what, there's nothing that brings more satisfaction. Up front, it might look, oh man, that's a high call. That's a hard thing. No, it isn't. When, when you get the passion of God working through you, man, there's nothing that I would exchange for it. So we got to walk in the Spirit, and it's up to us to do it. And if you've been thinking, I need to give more of the Spirit, I need to have more of the Spirit, stop saying that and just do it today. You have to exchange your affections, your passions for His passions. And if you don't know what His passions are, just start asking Him and start reading the Bible, and you'll see what He's passionate about. Link up with Him and His passion, and then you'll have His life operating through you. That's where love comes, joy comes, peace comes, everything comes. So let us not be, this is where we're going to end, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Again, you see how he keeps going back? Provoking one another or envying one another. Don't provoke people to anger. Don't provoke one another to anger. Don't provoke one another to bitterness and strife. Don't get contentious. Don't desire vain glory. That is to be puffed up beyond. Don't, don't desire people to worship you or applaud you or pat you on the back or recognize you. It's all about the Spirit of God. It's all about Him being glorified. I want to, while we're thinking about this, let's read James 3 and, and then we'll really close. This is a bonus tonight. I'm giving you a bonus uh, this is so critical. I think uh, it, this pa this passage here uh, has been on my heart, and it it to me is it, it'll help basically clarify everything that I've been saying about uh, the the attitude God is after. Listen, this is James three verse thirteen. Who then is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Who's truly spiritual? Is what he's asking. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. If you really want to show how spiritual you are, you have to show out of a meekness, out of a lowliness, and out of good conversation. That's, that's not communication. Conversation in the King James means a lifestyle. So out of a good lifestyle, living a clean life with good works and meekness, that is lowliness and wisdom. But he said, verse 14, if you have bitter envying, remember he just warned us against envy in the, in the end of Galatians 5. If you have bitter envy, if you walk in bitterness and envy, looking at others with, with an envy, uh, either a jealousy or looking down on people or looking at people with the wrong heart or outlook, do not, uh, do not glory. In other words, if you think you're spiritual, you think you're really a, a, a great person of God, real spiritual, but you have strife in your heart, you have bitter envying in your heart toward other believers, do not glory. Do not puff yourself up. I don't care if you can quote the New Testament backward and forward. I don't care if you're the best preacher. I don't care if you have a healing gift. You can cast out demons. You can prophesy. I don't care if you speak in tongues, interpretation, and you have all, all nine gifts of the Holy Ghost and then some. Don't, don't allow yourself to be puffed up to think you're anything if you have bitterness in your heart. 
This is the Bible speaking. If anyone among you seems to be wise or, a, you know, something, if he has bitter envying and strife in his heart, do not glory and do not lie against the truth because this wisdom descendeth not from above. This did not come from God, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where there's, listen closely, where there's envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. If you have strife in your marriage and in your home, I want to encourage you to get that thing out of there. I can tell you from experience, my wife and I, we weren't saved when we were married the first few years. It was like a civil war in our home almost every day. We were in knockdown, drag out arguments and fights and we didn't know how to live in peace. We didn't know how to get along. Let me tell you, I've lived like that. I know the, 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 the death that that is, the trap that that is. Listen, that is not from God. That is earthly, sensual, and devilish. So you say, well, I got to go home and stop fighting with my wife. No, you need to get in the spirit. You see what he said in Galatians 5, walk in the spirit and you'll stop that nonsense. Walk in, when you live sensitive to the Holy Ghost, you won't argue and fight and strive all the time. You won't be able to live in it. As soon as strife enters your, your, your spirit, you, you will know it. You will say, I have to get this out. I have to pray. I have to, I have to forgive. I have to get right with God. I have to get right with my wife. I have to get right with my brother. You are not spiritual if you're living in strife in any way, shape, or form. You, you have zero spirituality if you're living a life of strife. Some people exchange uh, this love and mercy and walking in holiness with a fat head of doctrines and think because they have a lot of doctrine or they can preach well, it, it, it overrides their striving and envying and bitterness. No, it doesn't. You're deceiving yourself into thinking you're spiritual because you have head knowledge. To God, the most important thing is how we get along with first him and then other people. So wherever envy is, wherever strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. That's a, that's a big deal to God. But he said, listen, the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Has to be pure first. If it's not pure, it isn't God's wisdom. If it's God's, it's pure. Second, it's peaceable. Purity and peace go together. Holiness with all men and peace without which no man will see the Lord. Peace and holiness, peace and purity. They're, they're sisters. You can't have one without the other. And you got to be gentle. You know, there's, there's going to be every opportunity to lash back at people. People are, 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 are going to give you every opportunity to lash back. The man of God who's walking in the spirit will learn to bite his tongue. Will learn to wit, wit, with, withhold. He'll hold back. Uh, being right, winning arguments, all these other things. It's not godly. Let them be right. Let them take advantage of you. Let them, let them win. But don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't enter strife. Don't entertain it because it's demonic. Look, it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. So he said it has to be pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. That is easy to be received by other people. What you're saying has to be easily entreated, easy to be received. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to accept what you say. And of course, not everybody's going to be friendly with you. And, you know, but, you know, then you just shake the dust off your feet. You don't strive and contend and fight and war. Remember, after the first and second admonition, Paul said, reject those who don't receive the word. Reject them. Don't argue. Don't fight. Don't allow them to get you in the, in the flesh. If you give them the truth of God once and then twice, the Bible says reject them. Just let them go. That doesn't mean fight them, argue, war, prove your point. If, if you allow the devil to get you into argument and strife and carnality, you just go right out of the spirit. So it's gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So you can see there's an attitude that God is after. It's peace. It's joy. It's mercy. It's not partial. It's pure. It's easy to be entreated. It's love. It's serving one another. We can't undervalue or underestimate that, that basis of our faith. It has to be in love or it's nothing. So God bless you. I appreciate every one of you. I hope you're all doing well in Jesus. Uh, we'll get back together here in a few days and cover Galatians 6. I, I'm excited about it. Galatians 6 is a very, very powerful one. I'll try to get to it in the next two to three days. I hope you're all doing well. If you have any needs, you can email me on our website, awakenministries.info. Uh, check me out on there. And if you got any messages, you got a question, uh, maybe there's something you'd like me to answer live, uh, uh, some scripture or some, some statement, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Anything I can do to help you. Uh, I love you guys and I'm here for you. God bless and we'll see you soon. Take care.